Welcome back, everybody. This week, we are going to talk about healing from trauma and religion. Originally, I was going to call it healing from the trauma of religion, but there is a lot of types of trauma in this life, not just religious fundamentalist trauma, but I'm hoping that I show how all of them kind of go together and how they're all linked and how we can begin the healing process from all of them. So we're about to go on a journey. So I'm going to need you to stick with me because I have to touch on a couple different topics. And then my hope and goal and prayer is to bring this whole thing home and bring it all together. So by the end, it all makes sense. And I pray that it blesses you with a new level of understanding of why you may be the way you are, why you may do some of the things you do, and why some of the people in your life, like maybe parents or family members or our spouses or people we've been in relationships with, why they were the way they were. And, and maybe it'll give us some, some empowerment to be able to forgive them and ourselves and also to begin the healing process. Now, like I said, I have to, I have to talk about a couple different things and then bring them all together. And so how I stumbled upon this is because when I was when I was little, I was probably like six years old. We were living in Germany and I was riding in a car with my uncle and he was intoxicated and he swerved across the street into a construction site and we smashed into a pile of bricks and I flew from the back seat of the car through the windshield and hit the bricks with the side of my head. I was unconscious for a while. When I woke up, a construction worker was carrying me. It felt like my face was gone. It felt like this whole side of my face was caved in. And for those of you that know me or have taken the time to zoom in on my face, you could tell I have scars on my head, under my eye, and on the side. And um, so what, what that did was it caused neck injury to me. So when I was a teenager, I started getting neck aches and, and migraines, and that kind of followed me through my adult life. And as I was going to chiropractors and, and through different healing modalities trying to heal that, uh, one of the chiropractors told me that he thought that was trauma. It was, there was still trauma in my body kind of trapped there and that I needed to release that trauma. So I never heard of that before. So I started looking into it and I started Googling it and watching lectures about trauma. And then as I watched lectures on trauma, I, I found out there's other types of trauma. There's not just physical trauma, like if you got shot or were you in a car accident or some type of a major physical trauma, right? There's emotional, mental, and spiritual trauma that I had no idea even existed until I watched a lecture on it. And after I watched the lecture, it was like an hour-long lecture, I thought, oh, wow, like I have there was five symptoms that that particular lecture talked about. I'm going to talk about some of the stuff in a second, but I was like, I have all of that. I wonder if I have trauma. And then I started remembering things, you know, for, for an example, I think we all have trauma to a certain extent, knowing what I know now. Um, most of us don't think we have it. So I, I'll give you an example. When I was younger, one night I was sleeping and I heard my dad come in with, with my uncle, one of my uncles, and they were yelling and they were drunk and they woke up my mom and I heard them kind of just like laughing and yelling and, and being kind of verbally abusive. And then I heard a gunshot. And so I was laying in bed. I was probably like 11-ish, 11 years old. And I thought they shot my mom. And so I was paralyzed with fear and I didn't know what to do. I slowly got up and I went to the door to look and I opened the door and, you know, I saw what they actually did is my uncle had shot an angel statue that my mom had. It was kind of his protest. My mom was Catholic. My uncle was Muslim. It was kind of his little way of, of not being nice to angels, I guess. Um, and I just figured like things like that were just a part of life. And then you move on and that, that they don't have an effect on you later. Come to find out that I might have been wrong about that. Um, so trauma, the definition of trauma is trauma is the response to a deeply distressing or disturbing event that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope, causes feelings of helplessness, fear, 
diminishes their sense of self and their ability to feel a full range of emotions and experiences. Now, I used to think PTSD or PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, was something that people had if they were in war or something extremely distressful like that. From watching lectures on this and reading about it, it comes to I came to find out that that's absolutely not true. Um, so some of the symptoms are PTSD, SD, uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, anxiousness, disassociative disorders, substance abuse problems, and all types of addictions, a negative outlook on life, nightmares, insomnia, difficulty with relationships, emotional outbursts, poor sense of self-worth or self-loathing, hypervigilance. You're always, you're always kind of in that fight or flight um, mode of living. Overreacting, eating disorders. Now, studying this, one of the things that really came to mind is that all the, according, so here, let me see, where, where should I start with this? There's a guy you could look up, his name is Gabor Mate. He really deals with this deeply and he deals with addictions and he says that there's no one that's addictive that's addicted to something that isn't dealing with trauma but we don't know how to deal with it so we self-medicate so according to him everyone everyone that has an addiction problem they have trauma that they've never processed that that they're holding on to they don't know how to work through it and so the addictions help us to medicate and to kind of deal with life. Now, one of the one of the problems with having prolonged traumatic, inst uh, stressful instances when we're younger is that our minds are not yet fully developed, so we don't know how to process it. All we know is fear, worry, you know, feeling like we're unsafe, insecurity, and that's that gets put into our subconscious, and then we move on with life most of the times reacting completely unconsciously. Now, I wanna make a little caveat here. It's kind of crazy to think this all the way through. Because if we look at how religion kind of treats this, all the people that have gone through stress, pain, suffering, abuse, and these traumatic situations, that then turn into drug addicts, prostitutes, gangbangers, you know, or, or any of the myriad of things that happen to us when we've gone through trauma, those are the exact same people that a lot of religious people then send to hell, right? Then we say, oh, well, look at, look at how you are. This is your doing. You have free will. And if you don't choose the right thing, you're going to go to hell. The exact opposite of the truth and the exact opposite of what those people are what all of us need to hear when we're going through pain. Trauma colors our view of reality and makes us look at the world through a highly distorted lens of fear, uncertainty, and danger. A person that is dealing with unresolved trauma is in a constant fight, flight, or freeze response. So everything we do after, after traumas, right? And, and these things... It's called complex PTSD. The complex post-traumatic stress disorder is when trauma is accumulated. You know, it doesn't have, and it doesn't have to be some major thing. It doesn't have to be, you know, you, you were beat and molested or kidnapped and raped. It doesn't have to be that extreme, although that also is trauma, right? For, for the majority of people, it's not quite that extreme, but it's over time accumulated through family, through society, through through different means, through the church. And then it ends up manifesting and coloring our whole view of reality. So how we start to see life is not how it is, but how partially it is because of the trauma that is now in us, that, is, that has become a part of us, and that is showing us the world through that lens of trauma. So... Trauma also causes a, a disassociation from the self. Again, the guy I told you about, Gabor Mate, he's really big on this. He's, he says that the trauma cuts us off from who we truly are. My interpretation of that is 
our true us, our true nature is the Christ in us. So those traumatic experiences cut us off from the true us. Something to keep in mind as we're, as we're going to keep going through this. So the fight or flight response. To give you an example of how this might work in our lives for those of you that, that aren't familiar with this. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we have that, that response. It's actually fight, flight, or freeze. So if you imagine you're walking through the woods and a big giant grizzly bear that wants to eat you comes at you, right? That response kicks in, your adrenaline shoots up like crazy, right? Your eyes constrict, your, your stomach stops working, you stop digesting food, all the blood, all the energy in your body is, is put towards your muscles, right? You, you kind of like uh, tense up and you run or you fight or sometimes we freeze. It's a great thing if you're in the woods and a bear attacks you. The problem is, what if that bear comes home to your house every day or every night? What if you have to deal with that bear all the time? What if you end up being in that flight or fight response through life, which is very unhealthy? Um, that could cause a lot of serious mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical damage in our lives. Now, it's one thing to have that bear coming home every night. It's a whole other thing if we're then told, oh, and by the way, there's this bear in the afterlife that's waiting for you. If you don't make the right decision or take the right actions, there's, there's this other bear that's waiting for you. Oh, and by the way, there's another spiritual bear in this life. He's called the devil and he's got demons everywhere and they're just waiting to, to destroy you and, and to, to tear you down and to break you down. And what if we're somewhere where this kind of talk is repeated over and over when we're little and that gets programmed into us? Do you think that those low levels of stress, fear, and traumatic experiences can have an impact on our life, on our health, on our, our mental health, physical health, our spiritual health? Do you think they can have an impact on how we see life and how our personality sees life as far as being optimistic or, or pessimistic or negative about life? Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing and they don't know how to process the fear and feeling of helplessness. Trauma affects brain structure and function, the developing immune system, the developing hormonal system, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. High doses of trauma triple your risk of heart disease and lung cancer and create a 20 year difference in life expectancy. Like this is a real thing. It's not something small that, oh, you know, if you go through this or if you haven't examined your life to see if this has impacted you, it's a little thing, no big deal. This is a huge thing. It can literally change the course of your life depending on if we are conscious or unconscious of the trauma that we've gone through. And if we have processed it, or if we've buried it and we think it's gone, but it's actually not. Trauma and fear are so pervasive that they get under our skin and change our physiology. It colors our whole view of reality. So now, what does this have to do with scripture or spirituality and how might this have affected not only us, but thousands of years, maybe longer, of, of humanity and how that has echoed down to where we are now today. So, I don't know for how many of you have wa watched me talk about this story before, but a couple years ago, I had a, a talk, I had a meeting with a pastor, and it was kind of a pivotal point in my life in seeing how how this whole thing of Jesus being the savior of all, God being the savior of all, kind of plays out the dynamic. And we were talking and it was a weird talk. It was kind of tense. 
And I, I asked him, you know, about the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Wouldn't you want to know if it's the same all? And he got real like stiff. He, he got like real defensive. He literally made a motion with his arm and he said, no, I don't want to know. And I remember it was so impactful. Like his reaction was so weird to me. Like, why wouldn't you want to know? Like, just go take the time to study this, man. Like, why wouldn't you want to know? I think I'm beginning to understand his reaction. So why can't some of us see it? Now, I've talked about this before, but I'm going to mention it just real quickly right now, which is the RAS system that we have in our brain, right? It's called the reticular activating system. And it's basically a filter on our consciousness. Whatever we think is important, because there's, there's billions of pieces of information every second of the day, right? We can't, our consciousness can't process that. So our subconscious we tell our subconscious what's important, and then our subconscious processes all of reality and makes us aware of the things we think is important. You know, the, the common example of this is buying a car. Let's say it's your first time buying a Corvette, or maybe that's, that's not a good example. It's your first time buying a, a Nissan Versa, and you never really saw them anywhere, and then the day you drive it off the lot, all of a sudden, the whole world is filled with Nissan Versas, can't believe that they're there, right? They were always there. But the RAS system blocked you from seeing them because they weren't important. It was no big deal. So you didn't need to see them. But now that you have one, now your subconscious is like, oh, that's now important. I'll show you where they are. And they're everywhere, right? That's, that's one example of this RAS system. The question is, who decides what you think is important? Who decides what you allow into your consciousness and what gets filtered out. I'm beginning to realize it's the trauma that is partially responsible for us seeing these things in scripture, for us looking at life and seeing a, a horrible, like frightful, terrifying reality that's all doom and gloom, or us seeing life getting better and better and seeing beauty and love and joy and peace never ending, seeing the increase of Christ's kingdom never ending, right? How do, how do we see, how do, we, how do two people look at the same world and see two completely different things? I'm beginning to realize one of them is the RAS system, right? The filter, but how is that filter put on? Well, it's put on, it depends largely to a, to a very important extent, the amount of trauma we've gone through and how we've processed that trauma. So now, Philippians 2.12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Or is it, is that the correct translation? Or is it, work out your salvation with awe and wonder. The word salvation in the scripture, the Greek word is soteria. It means your welfare, prosperity, deliverance, preservation, salvation, and safety. It comes from the word sozo. It means to save or saved, whole, healed, to preserve, and to be made well. It means to be made healthy, whole, and complete. To tell someone to work out your salvation, to work out your health, wholeness, and completeness with fear and trembling is to tell them to work out the thing they're being saved from by using the thing that they're being saved from. Another way to put it is it would be the same as me saying, oh, you have a cocaine addiction? Work out your cocaine addiction by doing more cocaine. Oh, you have a sex addiction? Work out your sex addiction by getting with more prostitutes. Do you see how insane that is? We cannot work out our salvation with fear and trembling because fear and trembling is one of the things we are being saved from. Do you guys follow me? Fear and trembling are the issue. 
Fear is the issue. It is the fear that causes the trauma. It is the fear that causes our separation from self and from God. It is the fear, the uncertainty that causes us to do all the things that we are then later labeled as sinners for. It is the fear that go, that takes us in that direction. Why would we be asked to work out our healing with the thing that has made us ill? It makes no sense whatsoever. God would not tell us to work out our salvation with the thing we are being saved from. So, most of us, there's a high chance that Many of us that are watching this, many of you that are watching this, are dealing with some, some trauma that you might not even be aware of, right? Um, I don't want to keep talking about the hell doctrine, but, but this really, I think when you see this, it becomes incredibly, ah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating because I'm seeing now, I'm, I'm seeing that the, these people that the people that you know will attack you for for saying there's no hell they're so hurt and they don't even realize it they're they're in so they they're dealing with so much trauma but i believe they're unconscious to it they're not aware of it and they're trying to continue it right continue the thing that they actually need to be healed from it's kind of like the stockholm sy syndrome where people that have been kidnapped or people that have been abused end up then falling in love with the abuser and sticking up for the abuser or the, the battered wife that tries to defend the husband and say, well, he only beats me because he loves me. And I think all of us might have been there at one point in our relationship with God or in the church and we're making these excuses for why we believe in this God that's kind of illogical, the, the loving father that's gonna torture his creation for all eternity. Well, and then we make excuses for it, right? Even though we know we're conflicted inside, like, yo, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. But okay, yeah, you know, he really loves us though. Like, don't you want to be with this? And it's just this confusion, this confusion and this pain that all of us need to be healed from. It is confusion and lies that all of us need to get rooted out of our minds, out of our thoughts, out of our lives and start the healing process. And now, this kind of explains to me a little bit about the translators also, because, you know, a lot of times I get frustrated at or, or angry at translators, you know, and when I'm doing a deep study and I'm looking through, you know, four or five, sometimes 10 different translations and trying to piece together, like, what could this actually be saying and wondering how could someone, how could one person translate this? you know, into hell, because there's no such word as hell in the Bible, right? How would someone have translated that into hell? And I'm starting to, you know, think like perhaps, you know, who knows what type of trauma that person went through. And because trauma then colors how we see reality, it makes sense, right? I could, I could kind of logic it out now. Of course, I see that this person is hurt. They're scared. They're filled with fear doubt, worry, insecurity, right? They're, they, they don't feel like there's safety. So it's just like, I got to warn everybody. I got I to gotta tell them, you know? And I see this a lot with evangelists, you know? A friend of mine, they used to go to clubs and, and harass people while they were standing in line to go into the club and tell them how they were going to hell. And, you know, and I was like, dude, like, uh, chill out. Like, you're nuts, you know? But I, I could see now how it was the, the trauma he was trying to deal with being projected onto the world, his fear being projected onto the world. This might also explain why a lot of fundamentalists that believe in hell constantly see the end times everywhere, right? It's always negative. It's, it's very rarely anything positive. It'll be like a, a quick jump on the positive. God is love, but oh my God, you see what the devil is doing? The devil's taking over the world and this is happening and we're, the end times are here. Get ready for Jesus to come back and uh, fear, 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 doubt, worry, insecurity, right? And it's horrible. It's horrible. And I pray that we can get out of it, you know? So now healing from this. I think maybe my role in this, you know, there, there's four 
parts to the healing, and I'm going to wrap this up right now that, that I'm going to talk about. And I think the my only role in this would be the awareness part, is if I would help you guys kind of be aware that this is something. And then if you feel like this is something that you need to look into, I highly suggest you to. I'm going to actually, I, I highly suggest you do. And I'm going to post a video in the in the description that could maybe start your journey on this, but then there, there's a lot to look into this. There's a lot of books, there's a lot of modalities to healing, but these are the basic four steps to, to healing from trauma. Awareness, that's number one with anything. Making the unconscious conscious, bringing the darkness to light, right? Bringing light into the darkness of our subconscious mind, into, into our hearts and our souls and things that we've gone through and putting a light on it and examining it. Have I gone through this? Have I processed this healthily? Have I processed this now with the knowledge of God being in me, with me knowing I am not just an ego, right? I am not just these programs that have been put into me. I am something eternal and divine. I have something in me. I'm not alone. I don't have to go through this as a victim. I have the creator of the universe living inside of me. I can look into this and heal from this, right? So the first part would be awareness. The second part would be understanding, which is a period of time that we take to educate ourselves to this, right? It would be asking questions like, what does a healthy family look like? How did my family conditioning affect me? How did societal conditioning affect me? How did my, my cultural conditioning affect me? How did my spiritual and religious conditioning affect me, right? And then you start to seek out and be drawn to other people and speakers and authors that have kind of gone through that and that might be able to guide you in the direction to continue the process of healing. After that would be integration. So step three would be integration. Um, and this stage can be filled with fear and doubt and worry, right? Because we tr we're trying to protect ourselves because a lot of times these traumas and these, these subconscious programs come up as defense mechanisms, right? So we have some unresolved trauma. Somebody says a certain word or somebody says, says something to us that we perceive as an attack on us, whether it's our character or our physical safety, whatever it may be. And it doesn't have to be something crazy. They just have to say it with a certain tone or say a certain word that can trigger us and our defense mechanism goes up. I, I had that and I've, I've been working on that for years. I think I'm better than I ever was. I could be the sweetest person in the world. I, you know, I could, I could be a sweetheart. And someone would say just one sentence to me disrespectfully or speak to me in a way, I know now what it was is I was just then replaying what I learned in my childhood. And I would go from zero to 3000 in a fraction of a second. You know, so those are all signs that, you know, we have stuff to, to heal from. But during the third phase of integration, we could have some fear because a lot of times those defense mechanisms protected us, especially when we were children. But now as we're older, we can, we can thank those parts of us and we can love them and we can appreciate them and we can integrate them into us because we don't need them anymore. We, I don't need that part of me that the you know eight-year-old that went through something and then processed it a certain way. I don't need him defending me right now. He just needs to be loved and I could defend myself in a different way, right? You guys follow that? But so in the integration phase, we might come up to some walls like that that we have to walk through integrating those parts of us that have been wounded. And then the fourth stage is the being stage, where you're integrated, forgiven, accepted, releasing the past, tr trusting the future, and being in the present. A lot of people write me thinking they can't be forgiven. You already are forgiven. We're all forgiven. God has forgiven everyone. He will continue to forgive everyone. 
Now, if you have done something in the past and that now you're filled with shame and, and, and you know, you're wondering if you're forgiven, that's a sign that you've learned something from that. Now move forward and don't do it again. Don't repeat the same mistakes. You know, all of us are doing the best we can with, with what we know how. But if you know better now than you did then, okay, good. Don't make the same mistake again and put yourself through all that and put people you love or, or others through pain and suffering again, you know, but you are forgiven. So let us all work out our salvation with awe and wonder. It starts with the good news of Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are not just your ego. You are not just the programming from this life. You are not just the trauma you've experienced, the, 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 the tapes that have been put into us, right? That then play back the, the conditioning and the programming. And that's not what we are. We have, we have a treasure in this earthly vessel, right? A priceless treasure. And we need to take some time, take some time, find some silence, be quiet, talk to your father, talk to our father. It's all the same one. We're all connected at the deepest level. We are all connected. Start there and then reach out and start looking at places in your life where you might need to work through, where you might need to forgive yourself, where you might need to forgive others and explore the depths of who you truly are. All right, I love y'all. In the mighty name of Jesus, I'll see y'all next time.